This conference will now be recorded. All right. Hi, welcome everyone to the RTD Accountability Committee operation. This conference will now be recorded. There we go. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> welcome to the RTD Accountability Committee um, Operations Subcommittee meeting. It is Wednesday, February 17th. Um, I'm going to start by just going briefly through the agenda um, and just giving folks a reminder of what we're going to cover today. Um, we'll start out by uh, if anyone has comments on the February 3rd meeting summary uh, for members of the committee, if you all have any feedback or insight, please do provide that to RTD or sorry, to Dr. Cog's staff. Um, and then we're going to spend a majority of our time on two discussion areas. One um, is the state audit recommendations on fair box recovery ratio. And then we'll um, spend a, another portion of our conversation together on discussing the uh, recommendations based on the information that we heard last week. And so um, for the majority of the conversation today, just as a refresher for the members of the committee, um, we are going to be hearing from Dana Berry and Jenny Page uh, with the Office of the State Auditor. Today's conversation, um, or today's presentation, I should say, is going to focus on the fair box recovery ratio. And then we will transition into the operator um, discussion and, and formulating a recommendation that could be presented to the committee. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dana Berry and Jenny Page to kick us off on the presentation. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Had to get new, new headset. Okay, thanks. Great. So, uh, just a reminder that the Office of the State Auditor conducted its uh, performance audit of RTD and, and released that audit back in December. And part of that audit was looking at the fair box recovery ratio because we received a legislative request to, to specifically look at that. So chapter three within our report focused on that and Dana Berry conducted the audit work in that area. And so um, I wanted to introduce Dana to you. She is an uh, independent, contributor, independent contributor, which is basically a project supervisor within our office. Um, she conducted the work related to fair box recovery ratio. And so she's going to walk you through our audit findings. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to present our audit finding about RTD's fair box recovery ratio. Um, as Jenny said, I'm going to walk you through this finding. And if you have a hard copy of the report, um, please turn to chapter three, which begins on page 75. And uh, Jenny will also share, there it is, share a copy of the report on her screen. Okay. So I'm going to just start off by providing you with a little background on the audit and the fair box recovery ratio statute. So this audit was conducted, as you know, as part of a statutory requirement to audit RTD every five years. And we specifically looked at the fair box recovery ratio in response to a legislative request that asked whether RTD has been meeting its fair box recovery ratio requirements. So in 1989, the General Assembly passed a bill requiring RTD to limit its reliance on sales and use tax revenue and begin tracking its fair box recovery ratio, which is the percentage of RTD's operating costs paid for with non-sales and use tax revenues minus certain revenues and costs, such as those for the federally required ADA services, long-term planning, and rapid transit infrastructures. Statute also requires RTD to prepare its annual budget considering this ratio and submit its budget to the General Assembly's Transportation Legislation Review Committee. Turning to page 76, per statute, RTD's fare box recovery ratio should be at least 30%, meaning that at least 30% of RTD's operational costs are covered by non-sales and use tax revenues, such as passenger fares. Based on our review of the 1989 bill and interviews with RTD, the fare box recovery ratio is supposed to measure the efficiency and effectiveness of RTD's operations. Moving over to page 77, 
To understand the fare box recovery ratio and whether RTD was meeting the 30% requirement, we listened to legislative hearings, communicated with legislative staff, reviewed RTD board meeting minutes, and analyzed RTD's fare box recovery ratio calculations. So we ended up looking at RTD's fare box recovery ratios from 2015 through 2019. And overall, we found RTD has complied with statute. As you can see in exhibit 3.1, RTD's fare box recovery ratio stayed above the 30% requirement, averaging about 40% during this time. We also found that RTD has complied with the, the requirement to use the ratio when budgeting and gives this information to the Transportation Legislation Review Committee. Now, although we didn't find any problems with RTD's compliance with statute, we did find that this ratio might not be the best measure of RTD's effectiveness, efficiency, and operations for three main reasons. Turning to page 78. First, RTD has limited control over whether it meets the ratio. For example, in Exhibit 3.2, you can see that in 2019, RTD's depreciation and interest expense accounted for 46% of all expenses used to calculate the ratio. Now, RTD has limited control over these expenses because they fluctuate annually due to financial commitment, commitments for fast tracks and infrastructure improvements. RTD also has limited control over its fair revenue and federal grants, which are also used to calculate the ratio. For example, the fair revenue fluctuates depending on the amount of fares collected from passengers, and RTD tries to keep fares low since it's a public service. Moving to the middle of page 79, second, the fare box recovery ratio is also an incomplete measure of RTD's financial operations because it excludes certain revenues and costs like those for the ADA services. Also, the ratio includes grants and investment income, which are considered non-operating revenues. So the ratio doesn't accurately reflect operations. Turning to page 80, third, the 30% statutory target for the ratio doesn't appear to be meaningful. When this ratio was enacted 31 years ago, RTD operations were, real, were very different. The bus service area was smaller, there was no rail service, RTD issued little debt since it didn't have infrastructure projects like fast tracks, and its federal grants were much smaller. We also found that the ratio doesn't appear to be useful to those who oversee RTD. The Transportation Legislation Review Committee doesn't discuss the ratio at its hearings, and it's not used by RTD to evaluate its operations because of the problems with the ratio that I've discussed. Now, these problems with the fare box recovery ratio occurred for two main reasons. First, the statutory ratio wasn't created based on any industry standards. We researched the ratio's legislative history and industry standards and spoke to RTD management, and it's unclear where the ratio target and the formula established in statute came from. Moving to page 81, second, RTD hasn't developed a better measure of its efficiency and effectiveness. RTD management told us that it's difficult to develop such a measure that includes factors entirely within RTD's control. However, it also hasn't attempted to identify an alternative metric. Uh, last year, the General Assembly did consider a bill that would have repealed the fare box recovery ratio requirement, but that, that bill was postponed indefinitely during the pandemic. Now, uh, turning to page 82, uh, the last page of the report, given that the fare box recovery ratio doesn't appear to provide much value in assessing RTD's performance, We've recommended that RTD work with you, the, its, account, its accountability committee, to identify and implement an alternative performance measure that's meaningful and accurately measures the efficiency and effectiveness of RTD operations. And a measure that is, this measure should also be based on factors within RTD's control. 
once that measure has been identified, RTD should work with the General Assembly to amend statute to replace the fare box recovery ratio with the more meaningful performance metric. Now, I'd also like to add that uh, we did read your preliminary recommendation for a new measure to replace the fare box recovery ratio. And one thing I would like to point out is that the proposed changes do include something that we found um, made the fare box recovery ratio formula incomplete. Um, specifically, both the current ratio and the committee's preliminary recommendation exclude the ADA service costs from the operating costs part of the ratio. These ADA service costs are, are considered operating costs for the purposes of the annual uh, financial reporting. And we found that excluding them from the operating costs in the performance measure provides an incomplete picture of RTD's operations. Um, that concludes my this part of the presentation. Um, Madam Chair, if, uh, Jenny and I are happy to answer any questions from the committee. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna open it up to members of the committee if there's any questions, comments, um, additional information that you'd like to hear from Dana or Jenny. Elise. I would just say it's great that um, great minds think alike and we are suggesting getting rid of the fair box recovery ratio in our proposed legislation. Um, so anyway, it, that's very helpful to sort of get that collaboration and uh, we can use that as we advocate for that bill. Great, great, thank you. Yes, Kristen. It is absolutely necessary that paratransit, the cost of paratransit, which is a big cost, be taken into consideration as far as the whole budget and fare box recovery. I know that I think the last number I saw was in the $40 range for every trip on paratransit. There's no way that fares are going to cover that. And, and all of us know that, but paratransit cannot be ignored. And I feel personally that RTD kind of just doesn't want it, doesn't want it to be known as far as paratransit to be included in RTD's day-to-day -day runnings. Um, yes, Jackie. Um, it would seem to me, and I, I think it was beyond the scope of, of uh, this report, but love to hear if it wasn't, um, I'd like to understand what peer agencies are spending on um, paratransit. I think everyone completely agrees with with what was just said, and we, but we want to make sure we're providing an effective and efficient service for paratransit as well as as the others. So, because I'm curious how other peer agencies have handled that, and then again, I know probably beyond the scope of this work, but um, uh, if you uh, in your research have any um, guidance on what you think an appropriate uh, performance measure metric might be, uh, given given the work, and and I realize you know beyond the scope, but I'm going to ask, so. Yeah, I can, I can take the first shot at that question. Um, so no, you're, you're correct that the, um, the scope did not include specifically looking at the ADA portion uh, of the, the performance measure compared to uh, other transit agencies. And, you know, basic, Based on industry, you know, the industry standards, um, we we tried to take a look at them, but basically we were trying, we were looking to see if RTD's current ratio was based on any standards, um, and we found that it wasn't. So um, the national, um, the, excuse me, the Federal Transit Administration might be one place to look towards. For such information, but yes, and we didn't find anything that specifically looked um, any any information specifically towards um, ADA costs or um, one specific industry standard that we were able to include in the report. I don't know if Jenny would like to add anything else. Sure, I can add to that. Yeah, yeah. Our charge was really to see: does it look like the measure 
that the ratio that's in our statute, which is unique to Colorado, does it look like RTD is following that ratio? And then also we wanted to see, does it look like the formula is producing a complete measure of RTD's operations because that was the intent of that, that ratio. And so um, we weren't spending a lot of time looking at other peer agencies because this statutory requirement is so unique to Colorado. And we did talk with management about some other options um, for a ratio, but I think that that's something that you would want to have a conversation with them about, about what, what are some various options. And it, it looked to us like a, a measure would have to be designed. It's not something that currently exists that would fully measure RTD's operations. But like Dana said, um, and Kristen said, the, those paratransit services and costs are a, a good chunk of mm -hmm. what RTD does, and that's not reflected in the current formula. And so that was something that um, if the accountability committee is wanting a more complete measure, that would need to be included in the formula Mm -hmm. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And I've got a couple other formula funding formulas I'd love you guys to take a look at. Let me figure out how I can get that done. So thank you. Um, Brett, I see you've got your hand raised. You are on mute, Brett, if you're talking. Some people would see that as a great benefit, but <laughs> I, I was looking at the uh, 2019 uh, report uh, that RTD produces just point of information. The uh, the accessoride and uh, cab service associated with that. The average subsidy for 2019 was uh, 48 dollars and and 44 cents. And uh, uh, as I understand it, it's probably going to be significantly higher given the reduced level of operations and services and riders that we have in, in uh, uh, this year, 20, in the past year, 2020, although that report's not available yet. So, but in support of what Kristen said, uh, it, it really is essential services and mm -hmm. uh, it ought to be recognized by the legislature as essential services. We're, we're trying to move the focus away from uh, just fare box ratios, which there's so many ways you can distort a fare box ratio and trying to look at it across all the the uh, different uh, uh, mass transit agencies across country. It's almost impossible to do that because they all measure it differently. But ridership in the end is is the most critical measure of value you're getting out of out of a mass transit system that you're tax dollars are paying for. The more riders that, that you can provide services for, the ratio of that ridership to your uh, your operations expense is, is a far more better measure of value. Mm -hmm. You increase ridership, then you're doing a better job. You're taking single occupancy vehicles off the road in most cases, and you're improving our air quality as well. I do want to go back to um, to some of the earlier conversation around what is a better what is a better metric, what is a better goal or aspiration other than the fare box recovery ratio. Because I just as a reminder to the committee, this was a, a similar prompt that the transit center had provided us a couple of months ago when they were saying that we need to look at something outside of fare box recovery ratio. I think even the industry is moving away from fare box recovery ratio as the goal and instead moving towards these much more tangible metrics like ridership and operations and other kind of components. Um, I, I wanna open it up and get some insight from RTD. Um, and I see General Manager Johnson is on. I, I would love to kind of hear from you what's been emerging um, as some of the thinking from RTD side on goals. All right, well, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to address you all, and thank you to staff from the State um, Auditor's Office for providing the report. Um, there's a couple of things, because as we look holistically and what was dated is the transit industry as a whole is looking at better ways to really ascertain what the performance metrics are. Um, one thing for certain is, you know, ridership versus coverage. 
that's been an issue. And I'm speaking from my recent activity in California, where there's the Transportation Development Act in which the California state assembly uh, basically adopted back in 1971. And there has been constant efforts collectively throughout the state of California to reform that due to the fact that you have some areas that aren't as populous relative to not being able to achieve certain performance metrics regarding ridership, and then they're not eligible for state of transit assistance dollars. So the dichotomy I'm talking about is coverage versus ridership. So we have to ascertain what is germane to our actual service area and how can we um, leverage what is efficiency. So from my perspective, when I read through this report, and having had the context in which I just shared with all of you, it's really looking at revenue service hours from my perspective and compare that to boardings and fare collection because oftentimes when you talk about fare box recovery, what does that really mean? We use that as a catch-all phrase, but it's really fares that are paid you know, to utilize the service, whether you've actually dropped them in the fare box or not. Relative to a question that was posed about paratransit service, that's generally done separately just for the basic fact in which this all came to be, recognizing some of these um, some of these measurements and legislative actions have been put into place prior to the ADA, and nobody wanted to deal with that issue. When I say issue, I don't mean paratransit. I mean collectively with trying to do what we're trying to do today, identifying a viable metric to ascertain whether or not our service is efficient in optimizing. Um, the dollars that one's expending for service. So there's a couple of ideas, but these are just my ideas that aren't reflective of the regional transportation district because we have yet to delve into it as staff collectively looking to partner in conjunction with all of you. However, I do think it's germane when we use that term that we basically ident or define what that term actually means because I look at operational efficiencies as being the crux relative to a measurement. So if you're going to say, you know, Per 100,000 boardings, we're supposed to yield X. We have to ensure that we're defining what that playing field is. So we're comparing apples to apples and apples to fish, because in some other area where we're talking about, we want to ensure that we have adequate coverage, recognizing that we may have we may, may not have the sufficient boardings to justify a fare box recovery ratio. We're going to be in a quagmire. So those are just the you know essential. Uh, not essential. Those are just my uh, preliminary thoughts as it relates to this, but there are other elements, and I, as I said before, as we look across the country in reference to what people are doing. And as it relates to the Federal Transit Administration, I know, Dana, you wrote that I think a better place would be the American Public Transportation Association, because they've had conversations as it relates to this, because this usually comes from a state requirement, and, and FTA is looking at it from a federal level, and there's nothing there federally in statute to which we have to adhere, certainly at a state level. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much um, for that insight, Deborah. And I think it, it gets back to one thing that we talked about really very early in the, the committee around service um, and service delivery in addition to um, ridership and fare collection and that relationship. So it's, it's helpful to hear at least some of the thinking is aligned. We just need to get to what the... Yeah, it's the goal here to come up with a metric that is something that has then becomes law that like the fare box recovery or is that the intention or that's that's a part that confuses me a little bit no i mean I, so i would say for this committee i don't think we want to include anything that would then become law um similar to the fare box recovery rather that we would be providing rtd the recommendations um based on what we've heard in terms of what operate what um operationalizing some of the recommendations that we're providing within the law or within the legislation how do we operationalize that that's been my interpretation so for example we are proposing to remove the fair box recovery ratio well how do we operationalize that what does that look like um at least sorry i see your your hand is raised well i was just gonna add that yes indeed we don't want to take away one constraint and add another constraint um, through the proposed legislation. So the legislation just re removes the requirement, <coughs> but it does offer up ridership as um, divided by cost as a way, a metric for measuring sort of the efficiency and productivity of the transit system as a whole. Um, 
that informs us, but it doesn't restrict RTD to say that it has to be a certain number. It just informs us. And I guess just, um, I think that we should separate the issue of, of acknowledging the importance of paratransit from measuring the sort of productivity of the system, um, because paratransit is basically a civil right, it needs to be provided whether or not it's efficient or not. Mm -hmm. The ridership writ large of the rest of the system um, is something that we want to um, measure and increase the efficiency and effectiveness of the system to provide for increased ridership. And that's, um, I think, a separate uh, goal and, and could be measured by ridership as a result. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I agree with the, uh, the idea of including paratransit in the overall efficiency measure for RTD because paratransit needs to be provided re regardless whether or not it's a, a efficient. Obviously, we want to keep it as cost effective as possible, but we need to provide it regardless. Jenny, I see that you have your. Ooh, Jenny and then um, Jackie. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so um, I just wanted to remind you that the, the original intent behind the fare box recovery ratio was for legislators to see whether or not RTD is operating, like you said, efficiently and also effectively. And so you may not have one single measure that achieves that. Um, and based on this conversation, it sounds like there may be two measures, one looking at efficiency, one looking at effectiveness. But I would just um, encourage you as you're talking about different measures to think about um, what the legislature intended and, and likely what they're still wanting to know is, um, whether RTD is both efficient and effective. And I'm, I'm just not sure you can achieve that with a single measure. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I was gonna say. As you look at how uh, performance indicators for transit agencies or for any entity, it's not one thing that you measure. And, and really we haven't even touched on asset management. We haven't touched on labor utilization. We, we have it. And so, I think the idea that there's one magic measure that we're going to identify that's going to then say, yeah, we're good or not good is probably unrealistic. And there's probably categories of measurements or performance indicators. And I guess I'd love to hear from RTD what their thinking is around that. I mean, Deborah's got, a, could you mind if I just use first names uh, instead of, but you know, uh, <laughs> CEO Johnson, but Deborah has got vast experience from multiple entities and agencies looking at this. And so I think what we're all trying to get this same thing is how are we optimizing the resource that we have and delivering the best service that we can and with a host of things. So I, I'm really curious to hear RTD's perspective on this. Yeah, I, I do want to offer up Deborah, if you want to maybe dive a little bit deeper, that would be Great. Into, into those two that, that would be helpful from this committee. Well, thank you very much. And I agree with Jackie saying you can't have one sole measurement to determine the efficiency of a system. There's a myriad of different things, right? And then, you know, you want to talk about vehicle operability. Presumably, when you have some issue as it relates to delivering service, I, it's basically having to do with the schedule or the equipment. So anything you look at holistically needs to have a myriad of different performance measures that you know combine into an overarching scorecard or a dashboard where you can ascertain the efficiency of said system. So just you know calling out one in reference to doing that. So it's really trying to define the problem we're trying to address. The example I used previously looking at the TDA in the state of California, that was due to the fact that there were monies that agencies were eligible for. And if in fact, uh, you didn't achieve your fare box recovery ratio of 20%, you weren't eligible for the state of transit assistance funds. And so there are different aspects as it relates to comparing, you know, rail to bus, uh, you know, basically rural versus urban. So as we look at it holistically, I think it's incumbent upon RTD collectively as an entity to create alignment around what our performance metrics are and everybody should be held accountable because it rolls up into how we deliver said service. So if we have a headway that we're trying to ensure that's every 15 minutes, then you're going to have to have X amount of vehicles. And I don't want to get too down on the 
about how we deliver said service, but then you're talking about how you craft that schedule, how many vehicles you have, how they're assigned to a run in a block, and how many people you have optimally to deliver that. Because if you don't have all those aspects, then you're not gonna achieve those performance metrics. So as Jackie indicated, when you're talking about utilization of labor, you may actually only have you know, one operator available. So you may, what we call inlining a certain bus, it becomes a different route when you basically cross some kind of point within the system. So as we go forward, I think what I've been talking to the board about collectively is creating a strategic plan relative to creating alignment about what we're trying to solve because that in turn will help us formulate how we go forward and utilize that as the baseline for which we you know, make informed decisions. So past experience has dictated there's been a myriad of different things as we talk about boardings per hour, as we talk about, you know, actual seat time. And what I mean by that is, you know, or platform hours, you know, an operator, how long he or she is in a seat versus deadhead time. All of that basically boils down to how you deliver an efficient transit service model for the betterment of the constituencies in which we're serving. So that's just broad brush off the top of my head. Like I said, I have yet to delve into this with my team specifically as it relates to this one area because we were uh, waiting for the accountability quite naturally, you know, but those are some thoughts that, you know, we could probe a little deeper as we go forward, um, but it's going to be a lot more convoluted and there's not going to be just a silver bullet to address you know, how best we describe operational efficiencies because there's a myriad of other factors that we, we'd be remiss not to consider. Thank you so much, Deborah. And just again, for the committee, the, the purpose of this is not to, con not to constrain RTD, again, based on the feedback that we, and the analysis that we've done, but what, how could we continue to work towards solutions that allow them to do what they need to do efficiently and effectively? Um, Chris, I see that you have a comment or question. I want to throw in for net promoter score one more time. I put a link in the side here. I just think it is an awesome technique. And Deborah, I'm going with first names too. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, sorry, Jackie, uh, I do actually think there's some chance that that is a magic bullet kind of metric. That, that doesn't mean that balance sheets and incomes and expenses and all that stuff don't count, but uh, I'm sure you've spent time with it considering what you do. Um, I also just want to say to everybody that the, Cost per ride? I don't know. If it costs more, so what? Like a lower cost per ride is not necessarily an indicator of success. And, and so it's an interesting one to try to figure out that, that balancing act. I'm sure that's self-evident to everybody, but um, as Kristen has made you know abundantly clear, there are places where the cost per ride is not a motivating factor. And I think you know that that really stands out. But I also would remind everybody that the last estimate um, that I read was $1.33 per mile to drive a car. When you calculate in the cost of traffic and the lost productivity and the um, cost of pollution and the air quality and, 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 and. Um, and so there's, it's a tricky one, but I would just be careful that in, in looking at it, that, that being a, you know, a driving metric. So I just want to share that. I, it's a, it's a, I don't have any perfect answer, but that one just makes me nervous because you know, you pay for what you get. If I may, I just want to say, Chris, I support the net promoter score. I got to say there's some transit industries, trans, transit agencies around the country that have recently started utilizing it because when you can have somebody that's promoting your service, but basically all the things we talked about have to be in place. And so that could be a silver bullet because it's a roll up. So thank you for acknowledging that because I'm one uh, that believes in that as well. And that's something that I'm hoping we can as an agency get towards as well, because it really discerns how we're doing our best because you can have customer service, but if you don't have customer satisfaction, those are two different things. You've missed the mark and you won't have somebody promoting your services. Thank you. I'm just going to smile. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going to be just along in terms of the agenda unless there's any other outstanding questions or comments from members of the committee um, but again thank you so much David and Jenny for joining us and, and providing that oversight um, or that overview I should say um, related to the the fear box recovery ratio 
Um, I am going to move us to the next part of the agenda, which is discussion on formulating recommendations. Um, but before I do that, I just want to do a quick check in with Matthew to see if Kathy Nesbitt was able to join us. I apologize, I'm having some random technical issues. Um, I do not see her. Um, so I, I wanted to open it up for a little bit of a discussion uh, with this committee based on the recommendations that we heard last time. Um, Matthew, do you happen to see Kathy on the attendee list? We can't hear you. That's okay. I'm just going to keep us moving forward. Um, so I wanted to circle back around with the committee based on. I uh, do not see her. That's all right. We'll just keep moving the conversation. We. Um, I so do I, not. You don't see her. Okay. See um, Kathy on there. Start okay. before. Okay. Um, so just as a reminder to the committee, last meeting we heard from uh, the state auditor uh, team around the operator um, recommendations and several of the recommendations that were offered, um, RTD had uh, had agreed with and, and recognized that they were putting some work into, um, into addressing those. Um, so I wanted to make just a, a recommendation to the committee that we would um, we would support the, the recommendations that were offered within the state auditor's report in terms of the operator um, kind of working conditions. One additional recommendation that I wanted um, to just bring up to the committee, we in, in, com in a conversation with Kathy kind of reflecting on the recommendations, um, is that we may want to include some uh, specific language and or guidance on um, supporting the union in Kind of communications training and negotiations with RTD because that seemed to pop up as a again a record or a concern um, within the state auditor report. So I wanted to just open it up with for conversation with members of the committee to see if that seems like a, a something that we would feel comfortable recommending um, to RTD in addition to the overall state auditor's recommendations. Yes, Deborah. Yeah, could you could, could you elaborate on what that means? I'm sorry, Kathy isn't here. I'd love to hear her thoughts. Yeah, I am also yeah. a little disappointed that Kathy was isn't here. She was able to join us, and it looked like she hopped off for a little bit. Um, so, Jackie, I had the same question because when you talk about offer recommendations for negotiation, if we have recommendations for negotiation, we're not negotiating. And I don't mean to sound tongue in cheek with that. I, I'm just putting that forward because I think if anything what was said as it relates to state auditors, that in reference to what's prescribed in the collective bargaining agreement, it may appear as if RTD is hamstrung relative to alleviating some of the issues that were apparent due to the fact that you have uh, newer employees by default because of their seniority status, they may not get the optimal runs. And because of that, they need be what we call extra board, but recognizing that operators oftentimes will bid on an extra board shift because they want that flexibility. And so even though they're jumping around and they have different times, that's something in which they selected. What we were talking about working in tandem with the union is you know, perhaps carving out and having a set aside where X amount of operators could bid in order to minimize um, that because as the DOT prescribes, you have to have a total of, you know, uh, 12 hours off between the shifts to have rest periods. But the concern in which I've had for years is that I can't control where someone lives. So where you may not be behind the wheel of a commercial vehicle, you could be driving for two hours in your personal vehicle. So how does that balance out? So I just wanted to add that just for clarification sake, uh, relative to what we meant about working with the union. So when we said negotiations, that's, you know, something bargainable as we talk about the seniority status. So thank you for the opportunity to say that. No, thank you. Yeah, so there were two additional recommendations. And again, um, I apologize that Kathy wasn't able to join us today. Um, but two things that we were, were 
again, offering and, and something, a suggestion for this committee to consider would be what scheduling might look like in other um, agencies and how does that compare to the, the challenges that perhaps RTD is facing. That's one thing that I think we'll just need to continue working with RTD and, and identifying what that is. I've also asked Matthew, um, and I think what I may actually do is hold off on this recommendation, but there was another recommendation um, offered as a um, more of a, some communications training. Um, I apologize, I think I misspoke when I said negotiations, but it's more communications training um, with, with members of the team to really be, be clear about how we work together and, and address some of these other issues. So um, that is, that's what I just wanna offer. Um, Matthew, I don't know if you are back and if you wanna offer any additional. Oh, Can you hear me now? Is that, it You're logged off and on. Yeah, you're cutting in and out. Better now. Little. Frustrating. <laughs> but Madam Chair, I believe the the two things that you just stated were what Kathy said when we met last week. Mm -hmm. So we will get that clarification and, and request a more specific. Uh, recommendation for this committee to consider we'll provide that share that electronically yeah as you have conversations with kathy potentially about this i guess from a end uh it's been my experience when it, that uh flexibility is and the rigidity of the contract in my in my personal opinion uh and my experience as the mayor of lone tree has presented challenges the rigidity of the union contracts has presented challenges. And so if there's a way to talk about being more flexible in the um, process and the negotiations, allowing for flexibility, allowing for um, uh, some, you know, nobody planned on COVID. I mean, I have, what have we learned from that? How can we, how can we in, inject resi resiliency and some flexibility into the union contracts? I think that would be extremely beneficial. We will make note of that. I also just want to bring up a um, comment that Crystal shared in the chat in terms of um, if it's accurate to say that we still need to consult with stakeholders other than RTD to, to determine the best way to define success, efficiency, and effectiveness. Um, groups like the state legislature and APTA is uh, an exhaustive list. I uh, want to make sure we, we, we kind of close that topic. Um, it does seem like we should connect with other folks. Um, just to understand that and to develop the, the recommendations from this committee. Um, do others have thoughts? I see Jackie even muted yourself. I know, God, I'm sorry, everybody. I, somebody else has a thought, express it. But I just was gonna say, do we have any consultant time to devote to this? I don't know, it, it, with, with our budget. I mean, I just think understanding performance measures from other agencies would be beneficial. I do think there should be, um, in my mind, uh, kind of indicators and kind of an annual report. Are we trending up or are we trending down? I'm sure RTD already does that for some other things, but how can we present that uh, uh, in a way that, that satisfies the needs of the legislature? And then also I think provides really good data points for the public. Mm -hmm. And that is where I was going as far as let's do some comparisons. And right now I'm in the process of building a comparison with the peer agencies that have been brought up as far as what they charge for for paratransit, what their uh, details are about paratransit. Uh, and I'm, I'm working on things like, I'm starting with Access Ride, which is a door-to-door a -door service for $5 a trip, which is outrageous. But I'm looking at, for example, MARTA, which is $2, but it's curb to curb, unless you have a reasonable accommodation. So they leave you kind of close to your house and then it's it's yours from there on. But that also might explain the difference in cost. And they have a much smaller footprint than Denver does. But I'd love to see the comparisons with these peer transit agencies as far as this huge amount of budget that we're looking at for RTD. I, 
And Kristen, what do you think beyond just transit agencies? What are you about, can't we compare how these services are provided even by a private sector uh, company or, I mean, I, so maybe somebody that specializes in just that service can deliver it at a, at a better price point than an organization like RTD. And I know Dr. Cog has done some good work with Arid's Area Agency on Aging and providing transportation services. And I think, I don't know this, but I think they're, they can do it at a, at a lesser cost. So I, I don't want to confine ourselves, particularly with the paratransit services, to only looking at other transit agencies. Perhaps this is something that should be spun off into a whole different... Um... And, and I completely agree. I mean, the Area Agency on Aging can do a much better job. The Senior Resource Center, which was just taken over by VIA, did a much better job. However, that is for people over a certain age or people in a certain area. So. I think it would be almost impossible to do a comparison with that. But, but if we remove those those barriers, if we remove those parameters, those age and everything else, what why can't that entity be providing the service? And, and I guess I, I just want to think bigger in, in this whole, how do we provide mobility services to people who have different challenges, whether it's an aging challenge or it's a physical challenge or it's a, a uh, neurotypical challenge, whatever it is, how do we give them the services they need as efficiently as possible? And 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 I think there are other partners we can look at than tr just traditional transit agencies. You see, Matthew, you've got your hand raised. Hopefully, you can hear me. And uh, yes. am I in the technical difficult? Okay, good. Oh man. Um, so uh, the just want to remind everybody the Dr. Cog board set aside $4 million through the Transportation Improvement Act, uh, excuse me, impro improvement program over four years uh, for vulnerable population, human service transportation that is much more flexible than simply just for older adults. And so uh, uh, those services are being run through the Area Agency on Aging. So the Area Agency on Aging is providing services to um, individuals with disabilities, older adults, veterans, any other groups that that um, that may have mobility challenges. Uh, in addition, uh, it, they also are now, uh, Dr. Cog is the uh, designated recipient for the 5310 program, which is uh, for older adults and individuals with disabilities. So uh, the, the Area Agency on Aging at Dr. Cog is doing those things. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for jumping in, Matthew. I, I do want to just really quick drive the the conversation towards like uh, formulating some recommendation or identifying what our next steps are. So I, I included two prompts within the the chat for this committee to consider. One is what are the next steps for us to formalize um, a recommendation on kind of the sphere box? What is the the goal that we're working towards? And then what other considerations do we need to bring to light? So I've heard a couple of them in terms of comparison of peer agencies and getting some clarity around what that means in terms of paratransit as well. Um, Rhett, I see that you hand, have your hand raised. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I do want to say that one of the things we may want to look at there is uh, the, the idea of a dashboard, a publicly available dashboard. And if you try to write everything into legislation sometimes, Legislators, I mean, their ability to dive down into the details of functioning of a transit agency maybe are not the best way to do it in committee and to try to legislate all that. It may be better if we can find a way to figure out what information really may add value to anyone that's trying to look at the efficiency of RTD and include that in a public dashboard that's available to basically anyone. And, and Jackie or whoever may have ideas on what those things may be. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to work with you on that and in, in trying to figure out how to get it into the dashboard. And certainly RTD is, I hope, going to have uh, good ideas about how to how to do the dashboard. We'll recommend, you know, we're recommending a dashboard, but we're not we're not trying to, you know, say these are all the things you have to have in it. We mm -hmm. will suggest some things in the end. We, you know, we, the accountability committee, make recommendations. 
Yeah. And so uh, hopefully, instead of trying to get the detail into the legislative process, which can be a well, ugly sausage making, uh, we can find a way to, to do that within uh, some other uh, process like the dashboard. Mm -hmm. I think the dashboard gets back to the earlier question, though, what are the, the measures that would be most effective? And it's going to be really dependent on the audience that we're talking about, right? Uh, just everyday community resident is going to be interested in other um, indicators versus a an elected official or an institutional partner versus a, a I don't know. On-time service performance, right. for example. You know, yeah. if I'm a writer, I care a lot about that. I care a lot about that more than I, I do some of these other more esoteric measures like pair box ratios. I do think, however, that the one thing we seem to agree on is that pair box ratios are, are not particularly useful metrics. Yeah. Agreed great across the board, but just from what I've gathered. I can't figure out what it even does. <laughs> confuses the issue I think <laughs> so I've heard a couple of things in terms of again just next steps but are there other considerations that we need to look at Chris you know I do have just documented what you've shared in the the chat for us to consider um Jackie um Kristen well, do we want to talk a little bit about categories of performance measures that we think are important I mean maybe we just identify uh, as a recommendation, we think these are uh, the areas where we need to see metrics. We, we think metrics would be, um, not that we need to see them, but would be helpful in, in understanding the efficiency and the effectiveness of the operation. So obviously ridership numbers, we've heard that over and over again. Um, and I think uh, Rut mentioned the on-time um, uh, performance. I think that's an interesting one because, you know, let me set my own schedule and I'll always meet it. So, so how do you, so how do you, uh, how do you make sure you're, and I'm, and I'm sure, you know, there is a, there is a standard uh, transit metric that, that's used for that, but um, the, the high frequency, the frequency of, of service and the on-time performance of service, I think are those uh, things. I think that the labor utilization is another, um, area that I think we need to make sure we are uh, measuring. Uh, I think safety, which is a super obvious one, <laughs> is another one that we need to make sure we measure. And then the, the other one um, uh, I would think is, is asset management, right? So how are we doing that? And so uh, I think it's interesting to think about in terms of uh, bus performance and light rail performance, and maybe ha have two separate reports that, that deal with and those are the ones I just came up with, but, but I think that would be the recommendation I would make is like, let's identify the categories of measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, go ahead. No, I was just gonna mention, so Jackie, in the ones that you listed, I, I wanna make sure I understand maybe that the committee understands kind of how you're thinking of it in terms of those two buckets of, let's say, efficiency and effectiveness. So in hearing kind of what you shared, um, ridership and frequency seems to be under efficiency just how quickly are we able to move people um, and then are people able to get on from that customer user experience and then under effectiveness at least what I heard was on time performance labor utilization safety and possibly asset management I just want to get a sense from the committee like do those two buckets make sense and we have to incorporate the financial picture in that as well so yeah so and I'd love everyone yeah that was just kind of a throwing something at the wall react to it Lynn, I see you unmuted yourself and then Rhett. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I, you know, we on the board, we get this these reports on many of these items uh, on a very regular basis, some of them, many of them monthly. Um, and I, you know, I think Deborah's talking about looking at, you know, she has a broader experience in terms of whether we need to be changing those. But, um, you know, the safety, the um, on-time performance, uh, ridership. Uh, um, I'm not sure about what later labor utilization, asset management, um, but a lot of those things we get, uh, we can get the performance report that the board sees regularly, if, if that would be helpful. Yeah, that might be helpful, but um, I think that I'm, I'm also just wondering how do we con almost consolidate it? Um, I think that's kind of what we're getting to is the recommendation is 
it's great, but we have to search for it. How do we consolidate it in a, in to lift up Ruth's point like a dashboard? <laughs> Um, make it as easy as possible for people to see it so they don't have to hunt down the information. But I I, I hear Lynn, um, and I also just think from a board perspective, how does this support you all in doing your job more efficiently and effectively um, across the board? So um, thank you for that comment. Uh, Brett, I, I see your hands raised. Nope, you're on mute. You're on mute, Rut. <laughs> so the, the item on our focus area on this, you know, goals that we, we have to meet is to improve financial transparency, to build back public trust and demonstrate RTD accountability to the voters and public policymakers. And the strategy is to create a recommendation for a public online dashboard that includes how RTD money is generated and spent detailed monthly reporting of ridership and information on planned service changes and the rationale for those changes. The content should mostly be well-organized links to existing RTD reports, because RTD already creates a lot of this material, rather than having them go out and, and, and create a whole lot of new things. RTD should generate a publicly accessible prototype and then seek public comment before finalizing the design. So that may be something like what we're, what our recommendation on that part is. But we're really open to other ideas of, of what needs to be in that. It would be a good thing for us to, as two committees, to work together on. I agree, Rhett. Um, and on that note, I do just want to share with the committee um, that we are working to do a joint meeting of the committees to address partnerships but um and that we're looking at march 1st for that meeting so to be determined time and we'll get that information out but i guess to lift up Brett's um comments you no know, we're certainly reaching a point that as these recommendations are starting to firm up we will need to collaborate and coordinate across these um subcommittees as as for example the dashboard comes up and in, 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 in other committees as well um, I just want to acknowledge we have about two minutes left in this meeting, and I want to open it up for any additional comments or questions from members of the committee um, based on the information that we've heard today. If there's anything else that folks haven't said but would like to share, um, we'll take a minute or so to do so. All right. Hearing none, I have a few things in terms of potential recommendation that I just want to lift up to close out this meeting. Um, based on what we've heard, it seems like one potential recommendation that we are agreeing on is this idea of a dashboard. Um, we've started to in, uh, at least list out a few potential indicators that, or metrics that we would want to see under the buckets of efficiency and effectiveness. Um, this idea of a uh, breakout report, I'm just going to call it a breakout report for lack of a better word, around bus performance and rail performance has come up, um, and we'll still need to dive into that a little bit more. In terms of next steps for formalizing um, our recommendations, I've heard uh, some comparison of peer agencies understanding performance measures of other agencies and what that looks like. Um, I've also heard some performance measures around peer transit, and it sounds like, Kristen, you are already working on that to, um, and can likely provide that to the committee. Um, I've also heard a couple of things in terms of um, again, the public dashboard and how do we just make sure that the information is reaching the audiences that we've intended and just lifting up a comment that um, not only do we need to look at peer agencies, but also other uh, stakeholders that would have insight into performance measures and metrics. So that's what I've heard in terms of wrap up for this meeting. Uh, it is 3.59 and it seems like we've um, achieved at least most of our outcomes. Uh, I want to thank everyone for hopping on the call and we will go ahead and wrap up the meeting. So thank you everyone for joining.